Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Well, God is good. Tonight, we're going to get into the word of the Lord. I believe that God has a message that's going to inspire you and encourage you, and that as you apply it to your life, you're going to see fruit in every area of your life. Now, that doesn't happen because I'm an eloquent speaker or because I do a good job of delivering the word. I do my best. I study to show myself approved. But you know what? All the hard work and blood, sweat, and tears and spit that I could pour into this message really isn't going to do any bit of good. See, it's the Holy Spirit who is the teacher of the church. Holy Spirit is the one that drops the word on the inside of us and knows how to sow the seed into the heart. And so we got to get ourselves ready not to hear from a man or a woman or the young or the old, the black, the white, the brown, or any other color you could imagine. No, that's not what this is about. It's about us coming together and hearing from the teacher of the church, who is the Holy Spirit. So if you would, if you have the ability to, would you stand to your feet and honor the Lord? I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord together tonight in prayer and invite the Holy Spirit to come and be our teacher. Oh, Father, we're so grateful tonight to come into your house and rejoice together, Lord. What a wonderful time in your presence, praising you and worshiping you, God. Thank you, Lord. We, we echo the words of our song tonight. Let us become more aware of your presence, God, and experience the glory of your goodness in our lives, Lord. We, we just thank you, God, that tonight as we press in and open up your word, God, that your presence, your spirit would come and be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction that each and every one of us need for our individual lives. Lord, we praise you and we thank you, God. That as we open your word, you open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. And may it produce something in each and every one of our lives. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, there are brothers and sisters, and at no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anyone else. But we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building one kingdom, that's yours. So God, we ask that you bless all of our Baptist brothers and Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you, Father, for Calvary Chapels and Harvest and for uh, Trinity, Emmanuel, Baptist, Ecclesia, for the well and the way, God, all the great churches that are out there preaching the gospel. Lord, we bless them this night as you would bless us. God, bless our Catholic and our Adventist brothers and sisters, Lord. We just thank you, Father God, for the diversity in the body of Christ, that everybody can connect with you, God. And we just praise you and thank you for that. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. And we say, Amen. Amen. Well, have a seat. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of 2 Corinthians. We're going to start in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. And tonight, we're continuing our thoughts from last week. Now, don't worry if you weren't here last week. That's okay. I'll get you caught up. But the title of tonight's message is Why Me? And this is actually part number two. Remember, last week we asked the question, why me? Why do problems happen to me? Why do difficult things take place in my life? Why, if I'm a Christian and I've got God on my side, why do I still go through struggles and problems and temptations and trials? And in part one, we found out that these difficult times will happen in our lives, regardless of whether, you know, you're a Christian, regardless of whether you're believing God, regardless of what you're doing in life, it's not always that you sinned or you were doing the wrong thing, that even when you're doing the right thing, that difficult times, adversity, trials, temptations, and pressures can come into our lives. Now, we examined the purpose behind it because... Sometimes we ask questions and and we kind of write it off that, oh, you know what, God doesn't expect me to know the answer to that. And yet I believe that as we approached this question last week, we saw very clearly from the Word of God that God answers these questions for us many times over. Why me? Well, God says, well, here's why. There's a couple of reasons. Number one, we saw last time, because you're a Christian. Just by nature, the fact that now you are one of God's children, that the devil is mad at you, the powers of the world are against you, and Jesus said, if you're following me, you're not greater than me. If I went through trials, you're going to go through trials. If I had persecutions, you're going to go through persecutions. You're going to be hated for my name's sake. And when we take on that name Christian, trouble's going to come our way. Why me? Well, here's why. To drive you to God, we found out that oftentimes in, without the pressure, without the problem, our heart easily goes astray. You remember that? Uh, before I was afflicted, I went astray. And yet now, God, I hold on to your word. I hold on to your promise. I draw near, God, because I need you. And that problem, God, I, 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 it, it's the pain that drove me to you to get the answer to the problem. Uh, Why me? Well, here's why. To develop your character. Remember, we all hated that response, to develop my character. What do I need character for? But, you know, God is this master uh, 
artist. God is the one that created us in our mother's womb. God is the one that's forming our lives. And much like Michelangelo with a chisel and a hammer, he's coming and he's creating a masterpiece. But sometimes he's got to apply something sharp and something that hurts and some pressure to our lives in order to, way to chip away the things that don't look like he wants us to look like. See, he's forming the image of his son Jesus in us, and therefore he's going to have to apply heat and pressure to mold us and to make us into the image of God. Why me? Well, here's why last time we found out number four, so that we would know war. And we said, what does that mean? That means that God doesn't want a weak church. God wants us to rise up. God wants us to know war. God wants us to have faith battles. God wants to not only develop our character, but to develop the heart that we should be passionate about the things of God and go after the things of God and not sit idly by and let the devil beat us up from pillar to post. No, we've got a war in the spirit. We've got to go after it. And these problems and these trials are training us for war so that when the pressures of life come on and when we have those battles, we can walk in the victory that Christ has already paid for us. Tonight we're going to continue in these thoughts. I've got four more things for you tonight. We're going to start with number five, just continuing on through the list. Why me? Well, here's why. Number five is that you're stronger than you think. You're stronger than you think. And I want you to notice up on the overheads, I put in parentheses, dot, 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 in him. See, because when we take a look at something like that, you're stronger than you think. It'd be easy for us to say, well, I'm strong enough to handle these problems by myself. I'm cool enough. I'm smart enough. I'm nice enough. I've got the best education. Of course I could handle the problem. And if we go out in our own strength, Bible says pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a great fall. You're going to fail with that attitude. Because, no, you're not strong enough to handle them. There will always be somebody or something out, you, out there that is better than you are that knows more than you know, that can do more than you can do. And so you're going to find yourself at the end of your strength, at the end of your rope, if you will, hanging on with nothing else to do. And so God says, I don't want you to go out there in your own power. Ultimately, that's going to fail. It's not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And so you're stronger than you think in him. See, when you've got God backing you, what is there that can come against you? Bible says, if God before you, who then can be against you? God is on your side. What can man do to you? And I can do all things, how? Through Christ who gives me strength. See, this is not about us going out there and bringing glory to ourselves. Look how great I am. Look at what I did. But on the opposite end of that, sometimes as Christians, we think that because we're not supposed to have any strength in ourselves, that we have no strength at all. And God is saying, no, 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 child. You're stronger than you think. You can do more than you think you can do. You can believe farther than you thought you could believe. You can go farther than you thought you could go. You have more on the inside of you than you realize. There is a resident power of the Holy Spirit of God, Creator God, Almighty God, God of the heavens, God of the earth, the God who formed the planets with the power of His Word, the God who holds it all together, and, and that same God is the same God that's on the inside of you. You're stronger than you think in Him. Let's take a look at it together. I had you turn to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. Now, all throughout the book of 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is talking to the Corinthian church, and they've had some guys that came in that said they were the super apostles, you know, kind of like they, they showed up in, their, in their, uh, you know, their robes and all that kind of stuff, and when they broke it out, there was a big S on their chest, you know, and we're the super apostles, and miracle signs and wonders are being done, and they've got this word and this enlightenment and that sort of thing, and the apostle Paul says, wait a second, we came to you as weak, we came to you not in our own strength, not in our own name, I mean, we wouldn't even take anything from you guys, we didn't, we didn't want you guys to think we were defrauded. You. Now, these guys come in and want to use you, and you're going to let them? If we would have slapped you in the face, wouldn't that have been good? You know, I'm paraphrasing now, but really he's talking about if we would have abused you, would you have loved us more, basically? And so he starts to give qualifications and starts to talk about strengths, but then he says, you know what, but I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to boast in my flesh. I'm not going to boast in abundance of revelations. I'm not going to boast in the things, the signs, and the wonders that have been done by my hands. See, it's not about me. It's about being stronger than I think I am in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 9. Paul is pleading with the Lord to take away a problem. See, there was a pressure in Paul's life. Paul says, God, I want you to remove this problem from my life. I'm being buffeted. It's a messenger of Satan. 
And it's not going away. And he says, I pleaded with the Lord three times that he would take it away. Verse number nine. And he said to me, God is speaking. Look at this. In some of your Bibles, red letter, Jesus is speaking. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect. How? In weakness. My strength is made perfect in weakness. So if you're feeling weak tonight, you're in a good spot. Because God says, my strength. The ability and the power of God is made perfect, made complete. It is fully equipped. How? In weakness. Let's read on. Paul gets a hold of this word, and once he gets a hold of this word, notice he doesn't say, well, I I ask God, well, then why the problem? God, why the pressure? God, why don't you take it away? God, what's going on? I don't understand. No, he fully understands. Look at how he responds. Therefore, in other words, because of what Jesus just spoke to my heart, Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities. You know what he just said? I'm going to brag about having problems. That's really what he just said. I will boast, I will brag in my infirmities, in the weaknesses. That what? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. He says, God, if your strength is made perfect in weakness, I'm weak. I can't do it. I don't have enough. I don't know enough. I'm not cool enough, smart enough, nice enough. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough resources. God, I'm just empty. I'm weak. Lay it on me, God. Because your strength is made perfect in weakness. Let's take a look at the next verse. Goes on to say, verse number 10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses. What? For Christ's sake. Not for his own sake. Not because he's so smart or nice or cool or talented. No, because Jesus Christ is working on the inside of me. He takes pleasure in it for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. See, that's an oxymoron. In, in the natural, we don't understand that. How can you be strong when you're weak? That doesn't make any sense. If you're weak, you're weak. And if you're strong, you're strong. And there the twain shall meet, right? We, we say, you know, that, that doesn't compute. But in the Lord's system, in God's system, in God's way of doing things. He says, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. And so we have to get ourselves in line with his thinking, not try and pull him down to our thinking. So God says, if you are feeling weak, feeling incapable, feeling like you can't do it, if the pressure is weighing on you so great and you don't know what you're going to do, you're in a good spot. You are the perfect candidate for the power of Christ to rest on you, for God to come in and do something amazing. Why? Because you're stronger than you think in him. You can't do it, doesn't matter. God can do it. You don't have enough, doesn't matter. You've got a father who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I don't have the resource. Well, listen, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. See, God says it doesn't matter. And if I don't have it in the natural, I can speak it and create it. Wow, that's the God we serve, the God who calls those things that be not as if they were. Wow, and now he's calling you and I to believe him for greater things in our life. What's the problem that's facing you? What's the weakness that you feel right now when you face it? Give that to the Lord and say, God, I need your grace. God, I need your strength. God, I need your wisdom. God, I need your way out of this temptation. God, I, I, I need your willpower. God, I, I, I need that fruit of the Spirit. See, as you tap into the Spirit of God, the Bible says that fruit are produced in your life, that, that naturally a tree will produce fruit, right, after its own kind. So as you tap into the Spirit, maybe you're having a problem loving somebody, but you tap into the Spirit, and you can't love them in your own ability. Why? Because they're crazy. Why? Because you're mean and you don't like them. I've been there before. And yet as you tap into the Spirit of God, now all of a sudden the fruit of the Spirit will pour out of you. Love will be expressed. Patience, kindness, gentleness, meekness, temperance, faith. It will pour out of you as you tap into God. Why problems in your life? Because you're stronger than you know. See, the question changes when you realize this. The question changes from why me to why not me. Why not me? 
See, if Superman can take care of bad guys in Metropolis, I think, why not me? Why can't I handle the pressure in my life? God, why, why not me? Why not allow the power of God to rest on me? Why not allow God to move through me? Why not have a great faith victory under my belt that I can tell someone about Jesus and how he took care of me and how he saved me, how he raised me up, how he set my feet on the rock, how I didn't know how I was going to make it, but God made it work somehow. Why not me? See, it was after the touch of God on Isaiah making him clean that he offered himself saying, here I am, send me. Before that he said, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips, but now all of a sudden he's been cleansed and touched by God and then he says, who will go for us? Isaiah says, here I am, send me. Problems? You want me to preach to people that are obstinate and won't listen? Me, right here. I'll take care of it, God. I'll go after it. How about this guy Jonathan, right? Here he is. They're encamped. They got a problem, namely the Philistines. Philistines had the upper land. They were in this high place. They actually were, were, were situated between two sharp, jagged rocks. Jonathan tells his armor bearer, Psst, hey, come on. Let's go over to the camp of the Philistines. Maybe God's going to do something great. See, he went after the problem. He said, why not me? Why not go do something for God? Why not be great? Why not have something his armor bearer said, do all that's in your heart. And it was after that this, that he said, nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. Wow. Nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. What does that mean? That means it doesn't matter if you've got one or 1,000. God can do something great in your life. Amen. So why me? Here's why you're stronger than you think in him. Number six. Number six, why me? Well, here's why. The plan of God. The plan of God. It may be hard for us to consider, myself included, that the plan of God for our lives may have pain along the road. But Jesus talked about the road. He said that the road is narrow and the way is difficult, and there are few who find it. If you think about a wide open road, right? No obstacles, no boulders in the way, nothing, just wide. That's the path that Jesus said leads to destruction. It's easy to slip into hell. But he says the way to heaven is narrow. If you've ever traveled on a narrow path, it's tough. It's difficult. If you've ever walked on a road that was hard and, and, and small, sometimes it's a bit scary too. And yet God is saying that that's the way to heaven. That's the way that we're going to enter, and there are few who find it. It's tough. You have to grow up after it. You have to work hard for it. You're going to have to encounter some obstacles. There may be some boulders and some trials, some difficulties. Maybe there's going to be some overgrowth all over the path, and it's going to be tough to find it. Sometimes you're going to be groping through the night, and yet the Bible says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. See, sometimes you may only have these couple of steps right in front of you, but if you follow the plan of God for your life, you're going to not only encounter the problems and the trials, you're going to encounter the pinnacles and the blessings. See, God is leading us on a path. There, there's, there's certain things in your life that you're going to go through that you're not going to know it was God's plan until you look at it in reverse. Are you listening? I heard one preacher said that Hebrew is read backwards, and oftentimes we have to read our life in reverse like that too in order to understand it. And see, so when we look in our lives, it, it won't be until we've traveled the road that we look back and we say, oh, that's why. Oh, that's what God was doing. I didn't realize God was setting me up for something there that I wouldn't have had this if I didn't go through that. Many of us already know that when we got saved, we say, my goodness, God preserved my life there. I didn't die there. I didn't marry that person. Oh, praise the Lord. And, I, and you know, I... I, I Anybody else have that go on in their life? After you got saved, you said, my goodness, God was guiding me and saving me and taking care of me the whole way. Now, now question, if God did that to get you saved, are you, are you following where I'm going with this? If that's what God did to get you saved, do you think he leaves you alone after you get saved? No, he's going to take you on a path. God is going to continue to move you along in life, and there's going to be problems and trials and pressure. Why? Because that's his plan. He's doing something. And he might be using you to do it, but it may be tough. But rather than throw your hands up and say, well, why me? God says, why not you? 
I've got a plan. You're a Christian. You wanted to be used by me, and let's get used. Somebody just said, man, I shouldn't have prayed that prayer. Lord, use me. <laughs> Turn me to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter number 45. We find a guy that went through a lot of problems. His name was Joseph. Joseph was hated by his brothers. Hated. Why? Because he was a dreamer. He had a dream. They interpreted the dream, you think we're all going to bow down to you, Joseph? How arrogant, how stupid. You're young. You're just a punk. Come on. Now, to add insult to injury, he's dad's favorite. Dad gives him a beautiful coat of many colors, right? And so the brothers all rise up against him, and the brothers are planning to kill him. How would you like to have your family members planning to kill you? Some of you said, yeah, that was my last week, Pastor. <laughs> So here's his family trying to kill him, and they throw him into a pit when they're going to decide what they do with him. One of the brothers talks all the other ones out of it, so here comes a band of Ishmaelites ro rolling by, and they're on their way to Egypt. They sell their brother into slavery rather than kill him, and they make a big cover-up story about it for their dad, throw some blood on his coat and give it back to their father and say he's dead. When in actuality, they sold him into slavery. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, he goes into slavery. He goes into a man by the name of Potiphar's house. There in Potiphar's house, he just serves. He's a slave. He just does his job day in, day out. Now, God puts favor on his life so that he becomes the head of his master's house. Now, things are going good until his master's wife starts putting some longing eyes on Joseph because he was very handsome. And so she comes and she asks him, come, lie with me, come to bed with me. And he says, listen, my master gives me everything in his house. The only thing he doesn't think about with me is you and the bread that he's eaten. And I'm not going to sin against God. I'm not going to do this thing. She grabs a hold of his coat. He throws off his clothes and runs naked out of the house to make sure that nothing happens. Well, she gets mad, lies about him, and goes and tells her husband, he tried to rape me. What is this Hebrew that you brought into the house, you know? And so his master puts him in the dungeon, okay? So he went from being beat up by his family, almost being killed, sold into slavery. Now he's a slave that had something good finally start happening to him in the midst of all the bad, but then yet it gets worse. See, he probably would have much rather have been a slave at the lowest level than be in the dungeon. Now he's in the pit. Here he is. Once again, God's hand is on his life. He becomes the leader over the prison. And there in the prison, he has all this stuff happen to him. Now, after all the, that happens to him, in one day God raises him from the prison to the palace favor of God's on his life, and he gets raised up into this great position of authority. Now he's like the prime minister of, of the known world at that time. And God has warned him that there's a famine coming, and that things are taking place. And here come his brothers. Don't you know family comes, you know, good times are finally happening. I finally got my mind off, and then they show up, right? So here comes the family. They show up, and he, he plays with them for a little while, you know. He has a little bit of fun with them, and, and, and makes sure, you know, hearts and intentions, all that kind of stuff. But the whole time inside, he's hurting. Whole time inside, he's saying, this is my family, and I love them, and I want to see them. I want to be with them, you know, and he's wanting to reveal himself to them. Finally, he does. Finally, he does. He reveals himself to them, Genesis chapter number 45, and he starts to tell them, it's me, guys. It's your brother, Joseph. Now, they just realized the prime minister is the one they were going to kill and that they sold into slavery. And so they're shaking in their boots. Genesis chapter 45, verse number 5, we pick up the story. Genesis chapter 45, verse number 5, take a look at this. Joseph speaking to his brothers, he says, But now do not be therefore grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Isn't that amazing? Joseph looks back over all the pain, over all the problems, all over all the trials and the pressures and said, Don't be angry with yourselves. God did this to preserve life. God had a plan. Verse number six, for these two years, the famine has been in the land and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. Verse seven, and God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. I don't think even Joseph at the time he was saying this realized that he was speaking prophetically because God was preserving the line of Jesus Christ on the earth through that family. Joseph is saying, I was sent here to preserve lives, Egypt and all the people in the land, that sort of a thing. He says, but even over and above that, my own family. God sent me here through the pain, through the process, through the trial. Why? So I could save all your lives. So I could save this family. 
Look at the next verse, verse number eight. So now it was not only you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. See, sometimes we get so caught up in the pain and the pressure and the trial, the moment that down the road when we look back, we recognize and we realize God's doing something there. God was working. God was making things happen. God was setting me up. God was getting my heart right. God was getting me in a position. God was driving me to him. God was teaching me how to work. And now I can recognize and realize that was the plan of God for my life because look at where I'm at now. Look at where God has brought me. Look at what God has done. Look at how God has taken care of us. That's what this is all about, the plan of God. Why me? Well, here's why. Here's why. Number seven, for others. For others. We just talked about how Joseph had taken care of the people of Egypt, how he had taken care of his family. You're there in Genesis 45. Just flip over to Genesis chapter number 50 real quick. Genesis chapter number 50, a couple pages over. And in Genesis chapter number 50, verse number 20, Joseph's father's just passed on. The brothers come to him and say, hey, Joseph, don't be angry with us. You know, when dad was alive, he told us to tell you to forgive us. And, and to not kill us. And so they're kind of trying to cover their own behinds, you know. And so Joseph is grieved. He cries. And, and Joseph comes to them. And he starts, starts talking to his brothers once again. In Genesis chapter 50, verse number 20, take a look at it with me. Look at what he says. He says, but as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good. In order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, this is a hard thought, but I want to I submit this to your thinking. Sometimes we need to stop and think that maybe our problems are not about us. Could it be that God is not so concerned with you and me as he is with other people? And God is looking at their lives and he's saying, I gotta do something about this. Something bad's gonna happen here unless I intervene. And God says, I know. I'm gonna put my child in this position of pain because in the end, it's gonna turn out for their good. Wow. See, it, it, it's a thought on another, another page. It's one of those you know, music from another room type thing. You know, it's, it's, it's a totally different thought, and it's a pendulum shift in our thinking. Sometimes we think when problems and pain and trials happen, you know, and, and, and we, we confess the word, and we're doing everything right, and we wonder, what's God doing? God must be mad at me. Something must be wrong. And yet God is saying, yeah, something's wrong, but nothing's wrong with you, child. You just keep doing what you know to do. Keep plugging away. Stay in faith. Don't get off God. But you keep going because the problem is not about you, it's about someone else. My goodness. See, we, we, we see this exemplified in the life of Jesus. Was anything wrong with Jesus? Was God mad at Jesus? God have a problem with Jesus? Was Jesus in sin? No, the Bible says he was without sin. And yet, I don't know anybody in the Bible who had more problems than Jesus. I don't know anybody in the Bible who endured more pain, more pressures, more trials than Jesus. His own countrymen were trying to kill him. People from without seeking to see him. Multitudes thronging him. His own disciples fleeing, not doing what they should be doing. He's teaching, he's training, he's going about. And at the end of all of his efforts here on the earth, what happens? He's handed over by his own people to be crucified. He's beaten and he's hung on a cross. And the Bible says he himself bore whose iniquities? So it wasn't about Jesus. It was about us. And him himself took away whose sins? Our sins. It wasn't about Jesus. It was about us. We were in a position that we were going to fall and go to hell and nothing could be done unless God himself intervened on our behalf. And so God says, rather than sit idly by, I'm going to allow the problem and the pain and the trial to go on my son, and I'm going to put him through that for the benefit of other people. That's true love. That's true love. And saint, whenever you think that God doesn't love you, think about Jesus. 
because he is the embodiment of love. He is the incarnate of love. He is the example of love. He showed us the Father. And the Father loved us so much, he took our pain, our sickness, our problem, our pressure, our trial on himself so that we didn't have to. My goodness. You know, there's another model in, in the Scripture. Another model in the Scripture we see, and that's the Apostle Paul. We were talking about him when we started this. And he said that he went through shipwrecks, snake bites, perils in the country, perils at sea, right? He was in the deep for three nights. This guy had issues, had problems, had challenges, things that took place in his ministry, people deserting him, right? At the end of it all, he's telling Timothy, I got nobody. I mean, come on. Somebody come and help me out, and yet everybody's abandoned the apostle. And what does he say about it? What does he say about it? Turn with me back to the New Testament, to the book of Colossians. A great verse in your Bible. A verse that if you read it on its own, you may kind of wonder, what is he talking about? Kind of one of those interesting verses. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 24. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 24 says this. I now rejoice in my sufferings. Once again, that's one of those weird statements. You rejoice? You, you're happy in your suffering? Yeah. I now rejoice in my sufferings for myself. Come on. It's okay to, to talk. This is, this is an interactive message tonight. You can help me out here. For, for himself or? I now rejoice in my sufferings for you. And fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Now, that does not mean that Jesus Christ's sacrifice and trials and pressures weren't enough. It doesn't mean that Jesus left some stuff undone here on the earth. What that means is, is Paul is saying that I'm going to take on the problem in myself on your behalf. Why? Because he's asking not the question, why me? He's saying, why not me? He's saying, I'm going to take on that burden. I'm going to rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. I will take on the burden. I will carry on the burden. See, because Jesus is the head and we are the body and Jesus suffered, therefore we're going to go through suffering. So Paul says, bring it on. Why? Because this is the sake of his body, which is the church. Paul says, I will lay my life down so that someone else can live. That's why he said, we die daily. We die daily. We go through, take up your cross and follow me, Jesus said, daily. You've got to die to yourself every day. Die to your own desires, your own wants, your own comforts in order to say, you know what? Someone else out there needs Jesus. I've got to tell someone about Jesus. I'm going to put myself in an uncomfortable position of loving somebody who's unlovable, reaching out to somebody who, I, who may not look like me or think like me or act like me. Maybe, they, maybe they, they don't come from the same place I came from or the same background. Maybe they don't share my views, but you know what? I'm going to reach out and put myself on the line, die to myself, and give of myself for the betterment of someone else. I'm going to love on somebody. I'm going to reach out to somebody. Yeah, it may cost me something. It may, may take money. It may take time. It may take effort. But if you do that, you can rejoice in your sufferings just like Paul did. Last one for tonight. Last one for tonight. And I like this one. This is a good one. Last one. Why me? Well, here's why. For God's glory. For God's glory. You're there in Colossians. Turn to me the book of John. John chapter number 9. Let's take a look at this together. John chapter number 9. We're going to take a look at two examples in the Gospel of John took place. Statements that Jesus made about people who were going through problems and trials and, trials and pressures just like you and just like me. John chapter number 9. Verse number 1 starts out. It says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. That's a problem. That's a pressure. That's pain in life. Because you don't experience what other people experience. You can't know things like other people know. You can't work like other people can work. 
So Jesus passes by and he sees this man, verse number two, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, teacher, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? You know what they just asked? The why me question, but on his behalf. Why him? Jesus. And they jumped to a conclusion in the way that they asked their question. Did you notice that? They said, who sinned? Not, did he sin? Not, is, season, is sin the reason behind why he's blind? They assumed, and they jumped to a conclusion. They said, who sinned, him or his parents? Did, did his parents do this to him, or did he do it to himself? Verse number three, I love Jesus' answer. He's so gentle, so loving, and he understands our hearts. That when he answers, he answers in such a way that there's no question afterwards. He says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. That's an amazing statement that Jesus just made. I was looking at that verse, and I saw that verse, the, the word in that verse called revealed. And it stood out at me. I looked it up, found out what it meant. In the original language, it really talks about something that was hidden that is now made known. Something that is hidden that is now made known. In other words, there was a question the disciples had. The question was, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be blind? Jesus says, neither. That's the wrong question, and something's hidden from your sight. What's hidden? The glory of God. Veiled in this man, veiled in this problem, veiled in this pain, veiled in this trial and this pressure is the glory of God. But guess what? It's going to be revealed. It's going to be opened up. It's going to be exposed. You know what happens if you read the rest of the story? I wish we had time, but the entire chapter as it goes on, this man gets healed. Jesus reveals himself to him, not only as a healer, but also as the Messiah. This man believes on the Lord. All of a sudden, he starts stirring up all sorts of controversy. People are coming at Jesus. People are asking questions. They come at the man. They come at, I mean, it just, it stirs up a hornet's nest. Why? Because God had a plan, and God was revealing his glory on the earth. Now, you're there in John chapter number 9. Take a look at another statement Jesus made much like this. In John chapter 11, in John chapter number 11, Jesus hears that one of his friends is sick, somebody who is near and dear to him, a man by the name of Lazarus. Now, we know this story. We know that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. We know about how he went out and Mary and Martha met him. We know about the fact that Jesus wept over this man. There was a whole process and a whole pain that Jesus went through to get to the point where he raised him from the dead. And that made known the goodness of God. Now look at John chapter 11, verse number 4. Take a look at the statement Jesus made. They didn't even tell him Lazarus died yet. All they said was, your friend is sick. Basically, Jesus, come on. You need to come and heal your friend. He's your friend, and you know what? You're close to him, and you've been healing everybody else. Your friend is sick. Come take care of him. Now look at what Jesus says. Verse number 4, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now remember, Lazarus had not died yet. He had only been sick. No one knew Lazarus was going to have to go through a problem called death. That he was going to be put in the grave, wrapped up, he was going to be embalmed, and a stone was going to be rolled over the place where he was. Why? So that the glory of God could be revealed. So that the Son of God could be made manifest. So that he could appear as he is. The healer and the one who gives life. The resurrection and the life. The one who will ascend on high. The one who's making promises and claims that even though they may strike down his temple, that he will raise it up again on the third day. Jesus is saying... I have a plan, and there's something that needs to be revealed here. My glory, my goodness, who I am, and this is not unto death. This is for my glory. This is for my glory. Let's bring it home, church. God isn't in the business of making people sick, of killing people, killing children. That's not God's business. But let's be real. Things happen in life. There's some tough stuff. Just Tuesday, four people passed away that are connected to this house. There's going to be problems that hit, going to be trials that you go through. There's going to be things that you 
don't like. Happens to us all the time. We hear stories that make us cry, that make our hearts ache, cause us to be up at night and lose sleep. Things that should never happen. And yet God is not in that business. But you know what God is in the business of doing? God is in the business of making all things work together for the good of those that are called of God and that love the Lord. That's the business God's in. And so there may be a problem, there may be a trial, there may be a pressure that comes your way, but veiled inside of that and right behind that, if you can break through that problem, you will see the glory of God made manifest appearing on your behalf. You will see the goodness of God carry you through and heal you and take care of your heart, take care of your life, take care of your family. Whatever that problem is, that pressure is in your life, God can handle it. Why? Because he's God. Why? Because he knows you. Why? Because he formed you. Why? Because he knows the path that he's taking you down. And God wants to reveal himself to you in a greater way than ever before. God wants to show you his faithfulness. God wants to show you his goodness. God wants to show you the lavishing of his love, but he does it in a strange way. He does it right through the middle of our lives, right in the middle of our problems, right in the middle of our pressures. I'll end with this tonight, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter number 8, great verse. Mark it in your Bible, memorize it if you can. My goodness, get the word of God on the inside of you so that when the problems and the trials hit, you can lift up your head high and say this. Romans chapter 8, verse number 18. Romans chapter 8, verse number 18. Take a look at this. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed where? In us. In us. See, the stuff you're going through today, church, don't even try and compare it with the glory that's going to be revealed in you. It doesn't compare. It fades. It's going to, it may look like a bright, shining thing right now, well, listen, on the end of that road, you're going to look back and say, that was nothing. That was a pothole. That was a bump in the road compared to what God's doing in me, compared to the goodness of God that was opened up to me. If you guys got something from the Lord tonight, come on, let's praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good to us. Hang in there, church. Hang in there, saint. My goodness, our God is good. God's doing something in your life. If you're going through a problem right now, you're going through something right now. Would you just lift your hand up? It's okay. Doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. Let's pray. Father, you see all these hands lifted to you tonight. You know every problem. You know every pressure. You know every pain. God, and you know these wonderful saints of God completely. Lord, I pray, God, that you reveal yourself in them, God. Show them your glory. Manifest yourself to them. Jesus, come and give the comfort, give the strength, give the grace that they need to endure the problem, to endure the pressure and the trial, God. And Lord, rather than say, why me, God, we say, here I am. Send me, Lord. We know the road is tough. We know it's hard. But God, we're following you. Jesus, we thank you that you made it, that you are now on high, interceding on our behalf. And so, Father, we thank you that tonight we have what you say we have. God, every need supplied in the name of Jesus, every hurt healed in the name of Jesus, God, every obstacle removed from the way, God, you bring the high places low and the low places up, God, and you make smooth paths before our feet, God. We give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, everybody in agreement say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey, I want to thank you guys for staying put tonight. I want to thank you guys for allowing me to speak that word into your life. I really do believe that you got something from God. And uh, it's just an honor for me. And, and tonight when I walked in, I just smiled because y'all were here. And as a pastor, it's good to be able to see people. And I just love you so much and, and, and am encouraged by you. And want to let you know that I love you. Tonight, I want to make sure that no one leaves this place and your heart's not right with God. I don't know everybody here. And I want to make sure that if you died, that you wouldn't end up going to hell, but that you would go to heaven. I said, no one wants to go to hell. I don't want you to go there. You don't want you to go there. And listen, God doesn't want you to go there. Do you know that in the Bible, the Bible tells us that God's not pleased when people die and go to hell. It's not the plan of God. That's not the will of God. And yet, God allows us the free will choice while we're here on the earth where we go, whether it be heaven or whether it be hell. Now, in our society, a lot of people say, well, I don't believe in hell. You know, and while that may be convenient, it's not good. Here's the reason why, because just by burying your head in the sand doesn't make something go away. 
Just because you ignore something like hell doesn't mean that you're not going to have to deal with it. And hell's a very real place. The Bible talks about it, Old and New Testament. Jesus spoke about it. And so just by thinking that if you say it's not going to be a problem in your life, doesn't mean it's not. You're going to have to face the reality of it. Sometimes people say, well, all roads lead to heaven. Maybe that's what you're thinking in this place tonight. All roads lead to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does say all roads lead to heaven? It's like saying all roads lead to the moon. Not going to make it. You could drive around this earth as many times, as many ways as you want. You'll never make it there. There's one way you've got to get there. Jesus came and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means it's God's heaven. You're going to have to get there God's way. Now, sometimes people hear that statement and they say, that's good because I know God's way to going to heaven is by being good enough to get to heaven. You know, I used to be bad, clean up my act, now I'm good. And, you know, I, I, I've done a lot more good than bad in my lifetime. So my good outweighs the bad, and God will see that, I know, and he'll let me in. I gave money to charities, been nice to my neighbors, helped people out, been a nice person. Therefore, I'm good enough, I think, to get into heaven. The problem with that statement is, do you know that nowhere in the Bible... Is there like a grading scale where you have to be this good and you get to go to heaven? There's nowhere in the Bible that it shows be above this line or do more good than bad and that'll get you into heaven. It doesn't work like that. I don't see anywhere in the Bible God is checking your goodness scale before you can enter the gates of heaven. Listen, tonight, if that's how you think you're going to get there, I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. You know, the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're not going to make it there on our own merit. You can't do enough to get there. Not strong enough, cool enough, smart enough, nice enough, like we discussed. It can't be in your power. It's got to be in God's power. Sometimes people think, well, I was raised in church. You know, parents told me you were Christians growing up. Maybe they hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck, had you baptized or christened as a child, took you to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. And you've always considered yourself to be a Christian. Born in America, America's a Christian nation. Everybody more born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians, right? wrong. You know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're raised in church, parents tell you you're Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you wear religious jewelry, attend religious classes, be baptized or christened or attend religious classes, or even be born in America, that that gets you into heaven. It doesn't work like that. And again, nowhere, check it out, nowhere do I see in the Bible that because you're some other religion, or that you're not some other religion, that by default, God loves you in the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Come on, tonight, let's talk. Give me some of your attention. Give me some of your interest because we're talking about your eternal destiny tonight. Sometimes people say, well, I, I attend church. I mean, I'm sitting in church in front of you right now. Not only when I was a child, but here I am. Doesn't that mean I'm a Christian? Well, that's like saying you could sit in your garage, call yourself a car, and that makes you a car. Mm -mm. You can sit there as long as you want. Never going to make it. Same way, you can't sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. You see, I get that, but my last church I got involved, I helped out, I sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader, I even taught in the Bible classes, got a membership card to that church. Now, while that's great, and I'm glad you did those things, could you just show that to me in the Bible, your church involvement gets you into heaven? It's not there. And nowhere do I see God's looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter the gates of heaven. So come on, come on, what makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Sometimes people say this, they say, but I know God. Uh, someone told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know God. I know about Jesus. Easter and the resurrection, celebrate Christmas and sing the songs every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you. Old New Testament scriptures. Doesn't that mean that I know God and that I, I'm okay with him? The problem with that thinking is if you'd read your Bible, you'd know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. If you'd read your Bible, you would know that the devil himself can quote scriptures and knows who Jesus is, believes that he's the Son of God, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. Look up here. It doesn't matter what you have in your head. This is not about having mental assent towards God or having head knowledge about who Jesus is, but rather this is about your heart. Tonight, I want to ask you this question. Have you given God all of your heart? Have you given God all of your life? Because if you haven't yet done that, I love you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. But let's not leave you there. I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. Bang! Pop my hands together just like that. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa. Wait a second, Pastor. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. 
Yeah, you might be embarrassed. Come on, let's get over that embarrassment tonight. Listen, think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. And yet tonight, your flesh is going to try and talk you out of it. The devil's trying to push you away from it. You say, Pastor, but you're pushing me. I feel like you're pushing me. Yeah, I am because I love you enough to tell you the truth and want to see you go to heaven. I'm trying to push you towards the things of God. I'm not trying to sell you anything or trick you into anything. This is an opportunity for you to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Jesus said you must be born again. It's that simple. Our, our society's made it out to be everything else that it shouldn't be, but it really, what that means is, have you given God all of your heart? Have you given God all of your life? Because when you have, God comes in and transforms you from the inside out. You're born again, brand new. And that doesn't happen half-hearted. In fact, Jesus said, I want to come and find you hot or cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, that's a little in, little out, little up, little down, little token prayer every now and then again. Occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not going to make it. Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, your call, your choice. I've done my job. I've loved you enough to tell you the truth. God's done his job sending Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. Now it's your turn. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, given him all of your heart and all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise your hand? Well, if you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Get ready to get your hand up in this safe and friendly place. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television in the foyer or in the Love Rock Cafe or online all over the world. Come on, God's watching right where you're at. Okay, I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one. Thank you. There's two. God bless you. There's three. There's four. There's five, six, seven, eight up on top on this side. Who else? Eight wise people already. Eight wise people already. Gotcha. Number nine. Thank you. God bless you. Nine. Thank you. There's ten. On this side, who else? Eleven, twelve. Got you up there. I already got you, man. You can put your hand down. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? About a dozen wise people. Who else tonight? You know, thank you. Thirteen. Got you up top. God bless you. Sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, go for it. You should. Come on. Didn't embarrass them and I won't embarrass you. Anybody else? Real quick. Just pop your hand up when I'm looking in your direction. That's you, and you know you need to give God all of your heart. You know you need to give God all of your life. Anybody in the foyer or the family rooms? Come on, help me out, ushers. You see anybody? Anybody else real quick? Anybody else real quick? Number 14, if you're sitting there thinking, gosh, should I do this? Yeah, go for it. So is he talking to me? Yeah, you. Come on. God's tugging at your heartstrings. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? I'm going to close it up in a moment. I'm going to close it up in a moment. Don't miss this opportunity. Thank you. Got you right there, number 14. Come on, number 15. You were sitting there waiting for that round number. Hey, 15 is a round number. It's a round 15 right now. Oh, my math people, my math geeks. Where are you at? Anybody else? Number 15, come on. Come on. Thank you, number 15. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise tonight. Woo! God is so good. God is so good. All right, all 15 of you, or you're the other five that should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Oh, come on, God just spoke to you right now. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand. We're going to give a clap and a shout. As we do that, that's your cue to get your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight, but we can't do that till we get you down here. So let's all stand and welcome them. No one leave during this time. Let them come. You come right now. Wherever you are, even if you didn't raise your hand, you come. Come on, come on, come on. They're coming. Let's give them a hand. If you raise your hand, you just come on down right now. Come on, you can come too, even if you didn't raise your hand. Come on, come on, come on. If your children raise their hand, bring them on down. Bring them on down. Come on, if that's you tonight, make your way to the front right now. There's still 
coming. They're still coming. Come on, there's room for you here. We'll wait for you here. Come on, come on, come on. You can come right now. All right, all right. Hey, everybody up front, put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing, all right? You came to give God all your heart came to give God all of your life. I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here to my right, your left, waving at you. This is Pastor Joe Well in the black coat. Good guy. Nothing weird goes on. Listen, it only gets weird when Pastor Luke preaches, okay? And, and you missed him tonight, all right? He's cool. Nothing strange is going to go on, all right? He's going to do three things. I'll let you know what they are in advance, okay? First thing he's going to do, he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again, okay? Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free stuff, some free literature that our pastors wrote that are going to help you find out what to do next in your walk with God. You need to do that, all right? Find out, what, what do I do now that I'm a Christian? That's going to help you, okay? It's easy and it's free. Third thing he's going to do, he's going to give you absolutely free a friend we have here in the church that we like to call a spiritual personal trainer. You say, wait, you're giving away friends at the Rock? Yeah, that's how we roll, all right? We give a spiritual personal trainer. What is that? Someone who will come alongside you for five weeks teach you five things out of the Bible, one a week, that'll help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord, okay? Now listen, your friends in the world, they're gonna take you back to the world. You need a friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. Now I'm gonna make a promise to you guys. Give us a year, one year of your life here at The Rock, sitting under the teaching, consistently listening and applying the word of God to your life. At the end of this year and for the rest of your life, you're gonna look back and say, my goodness, I didn't know it could be like this, okay? Am I telling the truth, everybody? There's a whole bunch of witnesses right there for you, okay? Now, it all starts with five weeks with a friend in church called the Spiritual Personal Trainer. He'll describe how that works. Again, easy, free, and then I'll let you come right back out, okay? So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hallelujah! Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.